On this week's U.S. Farm Report, a visit with three NFO leaders from widely separated parts of the country, Arizona, Idaho, and Oklahoma. Stay tuned. and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week, interviews with three NFO leaders, the first of whom is a young man whose roots are deep in the ranching soil of Arizona, the area of Casa Grande. Mac McDavid now works for the National Farmers Organization as National Meat Representative. Here is Mac McDavid. Are you uh, married, uh, Mac? Yes, I am married. Children? No children. Well, how big a family did you come from? I have just a sister in the family. There's four of us. Yeah. Okay. Did you go to school in? Uh, yes, I went. To, attended the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, then, in '68, went into the service, the National Guard, and then came back out and went back into the farming operation with my dad and. Yeah and have been connected with agriculture or farming since then in a more realistic way, I guess maybe earning a living at it, yeah. which is not too easy at this stage of the game. Well, I think that uh, your current activities are, are preparatory to earning a better <laughs> living anyway, don't you? Well, I think this is certainly I have gained uh, a very broad education and probably more commodities, uh, although I am in working primarily with slaughter cattle. but. Uh, gained a lot broader perspective of what we have really got to face in, in total agriculture and probably more areas than you know I ever would have if yeah. I had just stayed in Arizona and tried to produce myself out of business. Let's talk a little bit about your background in Arizona. Uh, tell us about your farming operation there. Well, uh, I, I said my dad has been involved in agriculture and I have born and raised in agriculture since and primarily our operation in Arizona uh, here not too many years ago was quite diversified. We've been in the cattle business for several years and also diversified farming operation and cotton and feed grain programs and whatnot and uh, under irrigation pump water in, in the Casa Grande Valley primarily. About 1962, I guess, that we saw that we were undergoing some problems and primarily involved price-wise with uh, our cotton and also our grain and we decided that at that time we would sell the farming operation or liquidate the farming operation I guess I should say which we did and primarily now are involved only in cattle so you might say in the evolution of what has happened in the agricultural industry which we were very diversified Ten years ago, farming maybe 2,500 to 3,000 acres of farmland, as well as two cattle ranches in Arizona, we've cut all of our farmland and row crop land out now, and they're primarily involved in the cattle industry, which is not too healthy at the present time either. Yes. Well, <laughs> you're joining NFO, you and your father, as uh, partners in this uh, cattle operation yes. and farming operation, was almost commensurate, I guess, with your decision to to liquidate your farming operation? Well, it? basically, we had probably already gone through the liquidation process of our row crop farming operation. As a matter of fact, I, when I went to work for NFO in February of last year, I was really not even a member of the organization. At, at that time, I had, had been on the ranch as well as been doing mixed feed and consulting work with a mm -hmm. feed mill and whatnot in Casa Grande. Well, now, Bring us up to date on just exactly what you're doing as a National Meat Department representative, uh, Mac. Well, primarily what my job involves with the organization is going in. I was, have been in quite an extensive 
training program since February, which has evolved now into uh, working in the western areas and our possibly new frontiers of NFO, where uh, we have uh, had not too many contacts or contracts, I guess I should say, with the cattle industry in the western United States. And we started out there in, in April of last year with a small contract in, in the state of California, where I'm primarily uh, have been for about the last two months, and have evolved now in moving into a new contract with a central location there involving uh, probably, you might say, the first actual supply contract in California with a hundred head of cattle a day in that, in that area out there. Of course, we are just barely scratching the surface, but due to certain situations, I think, that, we're, that we have seen in the past few months in the cattle industry or livestock industry, the acceptance with the uh, large corporate, you might say, or large individual feedlot in that area. These people that uh, primarily uh, a year ago were receiving 34 cents for their fat cattle are now uh, down at lower levels and in some instances are probably losing anywhere from 20 to probably $60 a head on the cattle that they're selling. So. These people are much more interested in talking with the organization, and, and uh, we are gaining momentum in California, and also in, I would say, we could even broaden that into Arizona, that there are more and more people are interested in, in the livestock industry in that area of talking with us. And uh, we, there, of course, there's a lot of hurdles that we still have to cross in that area that many, many of the people in the Midwest have, have crossed, but, uh, with the guidance and what basically I have done in, in, in the Midwest or getting right involved with uh, the cattle program and seeing what they do back here and then going back out there and we can eliminate many problems that uh, NFO had in its earlier days, I'm quite sure. Well, you had a track record back here right. in the Midwest to, to go on. This is true. And it guided you, and obviously guided you well, because it appears that you've been successful there in California. Well, it certainly appears at this time that we have been. Uh, it's going quite well. Of course, it, like I say, it is really, it's only been in existence as far as an actual contract for about six weeks now. So, But we are moving, and moving very rapidly with that contract. Mac, when you look into your crystal ball, what do you see in the future? Well, I don't know. I. You know, you, you can look at the cattle industry in, in several different ways, I think. Uh, we have many basic problems in the cattle industry, but primarily we've had a, a cyclic effect uh, in the industry whereby there's periods of time that uh, is rather affluent. Maybe for a period of seven years we have a little bit of affluence in the cattle industry, and in three years we, have, we lose uh, quite a little bit of money generally. But I think we're now at the stage in the cattle industry where the people actually realize that something is going to have to be done. The people can't sustain another blow like they had in 63, and uh, nor can they su sustain it from probably a twofold reason. It uh, looks, we've got an economic situation uh, as well as uh, other problems and, and things in the industry, but it looks like to me that we have to, we're going to have to make a lot of strides in a short amount of time, or else we're going to see some type of vertically integrated or conglomerate structured uh, cattle industry, and it is heading that way very, very rapidly at the present time by the mm -hmm. influx of our size of the feeders and, in the pri primary producing areas. Well, we've seen what the vertical integrators have done to the broiler industry. Right. And now the inroads are being made in the hog industry. Yes, they are. And uh, the next thing we know, as you say, we'll see this in the cattle industry. This is true. I, or I say it's true. I feel it's, we're already seeing a great amount of it. Uh, uh, more and more every day, I think, we, we see this type of structure going on uh, in the cattle industry because primarily of the size of the operations. These boys, you know, kind of like I've often said, you know, the, the man that raises 50 head of cattle or fattens 50 head of cattle a year in 
in Iowa or Nebraska, uh, he loses money too. But there's only real one real basic difference between the man that has 50 head in Iowa and Nebraska and the man that has 50,000 head of cattle in California or Texas or Arizona is the fact he's just got that much more money to lose that much quicker. That's just about the, uh, so really in perspective, it's, it's all the same situation. I mean, they're just kidding themselves. They say, well, we're, we're more up on the market. Uh, we know more about uh, the cattle industry than those people do. Well, I'd venture to say the inefficiency in the large corporate feedlot or large individual feedlot is, uh, you know, when you have, have to rely on people to drive a feed truck instead of the farmer going out to scoop it with a scoop shovel, that man makes sure that they all get fed there because he owns them. The inefficiency in the actual large corporate feedlot of people and equipment involved and maintenance and everything, really the profit margin uh, is not uh, the greatest in the world. Uh, they're striving on volume and volume is really going to kill them, I think, if we Either it's not going to kill them, but it, it's going to put them out of business as well as anybody else. After my interview with Mac McDavid, I had the pleasure of talking with Joe Taylor, who is the president of his county NFO chapter from the state of Idaho. How many acres uh, do you farm? Well, we have 2,200, uh, and we only uh, farm about 1,000. What what is the other thousand? Is it timberland, Joe, or uh, no? It's uh, drier land and undeveloped. I uh, see. Well, as I remember uh, in our traveling in Idaho, uh, a lot of that land, uh, when it's undeveloped, is pretty rough. Uh, it has a lot of mesquite on it, and you really have a job to go in there and, and get it off, don't you? Yes, uh, most of mine doesn't have very much sagebrush. Uh, some uh, rock outcroppings. Uh huh. I always call it mesquite. Now, is, what's the difference between mesquite and sagebrush? It's about the same, isn't it? No, actually, uh, I always thought mesquite grew in uh, Oklahoma or Texas. Well, I think it is down in the south or southwest that mesquite grows. Well, at any rate, sagebrush is the right term. And uh, uh, the government still owns land in Idaho that uh, is not developed. Uh, isn't that right? Right. Uh, a large portion of it is uh, what we call BLM land. Uh huh. Do you mind if I uh, explain to our viewing audience that uh, you're having some problems with an eye? Oh, that's, uh, uh, that's all right. And that the light here uh, is uh, bothering Joe a bit and forcing him to squint. But uh, if you don't mind squinting through it, well, we certainly don't mind ourselves, Joe. That's all right. Well, let's talk about NFO in uh, Idaho and your part of Idaho and uh, uh, something of the history of NFO there and uh, its progress through the years bringing us up to uh, to its status quo. Uh, now you've been in that area from Michigan for 10 years as you say. Uh, when did you join NFO? Uh, about four years ago. And uh, uh, when did you become the uh, president of your county? Uh, I've been uh, county president for the past two years. Well let's talk about how things were in terms of potatoes and uh, other commodities in Idaho uh, four years ago when you first joined? Well, uh, we sure needed some help uh, in improving our market conditions and all commodities at that time. Uh, of course, was my main reason for joining NFO. Mm -hmm. Things were pretty bad at, at that time four years ago. Yes, we uh, we needed to improve our marketing. And uh, tell me what's happened uh, during the past four years. Well, of course, we have continued to, to block them together and, and improve our markets. And, and they have, have improved. Uh, the bigger the blocks, uh, the better we have seen our markets improve. Mm -hmm. Do you have good membership in your county? Yes, we have a large membership, and it continues to improve. How many uh, members do you have, do you know, in uh, the county? We have approximately 400. Now, what does this represent in terms of, uh, of percentage of farmers in that county? Is this 60, 70 percent of the farmers? Um, or do you know? I don't know uh, at the present time. Uh, Production-wise, uh, I couldn't tell you that. Uh -huh. uh, this is, of course, more important the percentage of production than it than the numbers sure it is 
Well, now, you've done a great deal of work personally uh, in behalf of NFO in your county and in your part of Idaho, uh, not only in potatoes, but in other commodities. But let's talk a minute about potatoes. How about uh, sort of giving us some of the background that has led to the most recent potato holding action? Well, uh, of course, uh, we led into a, a distressed uh, situation last spring uh, where we had a bad frost condition. We weren't able to move the potatoes, and we could see where we were going to be forced to give them away. Uh, Phosphorly as low as 50 cents a hundred. So rather than do that, we blocked them all together and, uh, and went into a holding action with them. And of course, we held them much longer than we had any idea we were going to. We moved uh, some of them that got into distress as we could along through the hold. And ultimately, were very successful in moving him at much higher prices than we probably anticipated we were going to, mm -hmm. and uh, and did business with uh, with all the people in our local area, that is, all of the processors and shippers. Before we got done with the action, mm -hmm. it was a long, hard, tough struggle, and we gained recognition. And I had a lot of fun, disposed of all the crop. We did suffer a little shrinkage, uh, and we're very successful. That's wonderful. You know, Joe, something you said to me earlier uh, I find very humorous, and I'd like for you to repeat it uh, to our viewers. Uh, we were talking about uh, the Idaho potato and uh, the claims uh, made in other areas of the country uh, in that regard. What was it you told me in terms of numbers? Uh, I presume you're referring to the fact that uh, uh, I mentioned that uh, in regard to the fresh potatoes that uh, we often say that uh, uh, that there's about twice as many Idaho potatoes marketed as fresh as, uh, as we grow. <laughs> it's an amusing thing. I don't know that that's quite true, but uh, we often find that it, it, that, that is said. Well, this, uh, I think, speaks so well of the Idaho potato. Everybody wants to grow the Idaho potato, right. whether they're in Idaho or not, don't they? That's right. At least they want to make claims for that. Right. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the successes in your part of the country and other commodities. Well, uh, grain is one that we have had a tremendous success. We started our grain program uh, about three years ago with, uh, with quite a bit of success. Uh, of course, uh, we've re reoriented that program several times. Uh, a year ago, why we got a little bit foolish and set a target price, and it didn't work quite so well. But uh, this past year, we started out uh, with a new program, with a new grain representative uh, for the Boise marketing area. And uh, we had disaster prices in, in June, or well, rather about July, but uh, through a new grain representative uh, and with a 25 car sale to export into a different area, a higher priced area, we were able to advance our market uh, tremendously. I think it uh, averages out about uh, 12 cents a month over a seven month period to now we're back in real good position uh, we blocked it on a harvest sale. We have a long-term block. Uh, we have a short-term block, uh, which operates uh, very well. Uh, we've been able to move uh, everybody's grain within a matter of, uh, I'd say, a week or two of whenever they want to. We've been able to move all the grain, I believe, that all of the producers wanted before the first of the year. In fact, things are so well that our zone grain man wasn't even able to attend the convention with us. He's just too busy. Yes, yeah. he had to cancel out. Uh, 
Uh, we've been able to, uh, what we call the Upper Valley in the Idaho Falls area, we moved a contract for them a short time ago, and uh, they now enjoy the same prices up there that we do, even though there's a freight differential. Uh, the boys over in American Falls area enjoy the same price as we do. We've been able to uh, work the, all of the state in a compatible way that we don't tear down one area. Uh, I'm, I'm very real encouraged the way the areas are working together not to tear down one area, oversupply one area. Uh, this as it should be. Always before NFO got involved, one area was tearing down one, oversupplying another, and was filled with rumors of, of what was going to happen in another area. But now with the communication system that we have, we always know what the opposite area is doing with just one or two simple telephone calls. We're in daily contact. There's no confusion. We don't believe the truckers. And uh, the truckers uh, still are happy. They know where they can get the grain. We sell on about two week uh, contracts. And uh, I'm real enthused that, that in the grain trade, uh, we finally hit on something that looks like it's going to work. Later I talked with Leonard Hornick, who is the grain coordinator from Kay County, Oklahoma the first president of his NFO chapter in that Oklahoma County. Leonard, uh, as NFO county charters go, K County, Oklahoma, which is your home county, is one of the youngest and newest, isn't it? That's true. When were you chartered down there? Well, we were chartered in, uh, well, about 16 months ago, to be exact. Yeah. And uh, you were elected the first president of, of your county. That's correct. And I think that's a very nice honor. Well, I feel that it is. Of course, uh, along with that responsibility goes an honor, goes a little work. And uh, how much accomplishment have you made down there in the last 16 months? Well, in the last 16 months, uh, we've increased our membership around 30 percent. And I've got my county structure fully organized. My section foreman is working. The BCs is working. And we've got good response out of his own supervisor, and the boys is working real good. I think that's wonderful. Now, Kay County is in north central Oklahoma. In fact, your place is, you told me, is about, what, 12 miles north of Ponca City. You're, what, six miles from the line. That's true. Now, what kind of grain farming predominates through your area, Leonard? Well, our major crop is wheat, and barley is second. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Have you had some pretty good marketing uh, successes through that area already? Yeah, we uh, feel like that we've accomplished uh, some markets. They're not what we've been wanting, but we're working towards them. They're probably better now than they have been, oh, at yeah. least. And, uh, Quite a bit better. <laughs> any little bit is an improvement. <laughs> you betcha. In fact, uh, it would seem to me that uh, any little bit of improvement might be an incentive for some more of your neighbors down there to be joining NFO. Oh, yeah. The neighbors is beginning to get curious. They're wondering what them semis is doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> you yeah. let them know, and this way they're going to come along. You betcha. Well, let's talk a minute about you, Leonard. Uh, have you lived down in Oklahoma all your life? Yes, sir. I was born in Kay County right there. In, well, I was born in Kildare, Oklahoma. Kildare. Yeah, Kildare. Uh, is that in Kay County? That's or? in Kay County. That was in 1924. I'll be darned. I'm just a young fellow. You sure are. <laughs> Still uh, actively farming. Oh, yeah. And, I've got uh, quite a farm operation. How many acres do you farm? Well, we go by quarters there, and I've got ten quarters I take care of. Ten quarters. Well, now, you know, uh, when you get into to those kind of uh, terms, you lose me. In acreage, uh, what does that amount to? Well, I'd have to do a little figuring. It'd be equivalent to around about 1,600, 1,800 acres, somewhere in there. 16 to 1,800. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have most of it in wheat? No, it's about uh, two-thirds cultivated, and a third is in grass. Yeah. You, then you're running some cattle. Yeah. See, I've got a combination of, uh, I've got a stalk cattle, and I've got brood cows, mm -hmm. too. 
How big a family do you have, Leonard? Well, to my surprise, yeah, I've got six children. Six children. <laughs> right. Have any? Um, uh, have you have any boys? I've got two girls and four boys. Four boys. Well, that's what a farmer should do. Well, by golly, I was real me. fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> have uh, <clears throat> Have some of the boys uh, stayed with you in your farming operation? Yes, my. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, my oldest boy, he's in the service right now. Mm -hmm. My youngest boy is home helping me. He's home today. He's took the cattle off the pasture, yeah. the wheat pasture. It's rained there, and it's, they tell me it's snowing. Snowing in, in, in Kay County. In Kay County, and this is what we've been wanting. Yes, you but, need uh, it. He wasn't too happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> he thought you ought to be there you helping us. Now, I told him, now, if we're going to be partners, well, you, you're going to learn what it's like. That's right. Well, of course, it seems to me that to some degree, uh, with, the, with this young man on the farm with you, that you're helping to solve one of the really serious problems of agriculture today, and that is the keeping of the young people on the farms of America. And uh, you've been able to do it in part, at least. That's true. And uh, well, this is better than most, you know. Well, I kind of made a deal with the boy. I give him some wheat land and... We bought 250-some head of stalker calves, and I told him I'd give him 50 head. That would be his share. I no. says, you're going to start out at the bottom. You're going to work your way up. But even so, Leonard, it seems to me you gave him a better start than probably you had. Yeah. When yeah. I started out, my folks gave me one quarter land, and they gave me two cows, and my wife's mother, she gave my wife three cows, so we had five cows. <laughs> and we developed this from the five cows, I've got over 100 and some head of brood cows now. That's great. Well, now, what about these two boys unaccounted for? Your oldest, you say, is in the service. The youngest is on the farm. What about the middle two boys? Have they gone off into other areas of No, the they're young. I've, I've got uh, one boy. He's, uh, well, he's 15. He's still going to high school. Uh -huh. And I've got the little tadpole. <laughs> He's uh, five years old. I think that's uh, what's kept you young, Leonard. Hard work and, uh, and raising those, those children kind of a few years apart. You betcha. Well, I want to no. thank you very much for coming by. It's been it's a pleasure been a, talking with you. That's been a pleasure talking with you. And I sure do wish uh, you and uh, the other NFO members in Kay County, Oklahoma, the very best of luck. And uh, I know with the kind of leadership you're able to offer uh, your county, that only good can happen. Good luck to you in the future. Well, thank you, sir. And that was our visit with Leonard Hornick of Oklahoma. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this same station. Until we meet again. So long, everybody. <laughs>